God has designed prayer to draw us close to Him. Prayer should nurture our relationship with God. But too often, I feel, at least in my life, that prayer degenerates into little more than a long list of requests. It's almost like a celestial vending machine where I put in the prayer coins and out pops the E7, the safe arrival to my destination. Or an F22, the friend who needs the help. Or the C8, I push the buttons and out comes the results that I want. Now don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with praying for things. So it's absolutely right. God calls us to bring our prayers and petitions to Him. But if our prayers are made up of nothing other than requests, then we've got problems. Wouldn't it be great to have a church filled with prayer warriors, people who love to pray, people who are passionate about prayer, people who fell to their knees joyfully and eagerly who turn to prayer as their first resource, not their last. But I think for too many of us, we find prayer to be a draining experience rather than an invigorating experience. If all we ever do is go to God with our requests or the requests of friends or family, eventually, I mean, a list is a very boring thing to read. As you're reading through scriptures, what chapters do you skip? Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot... Yeah. We skip those chapters. Why? They're lists. They're boring. And if that's all our prayers are, God, please help such and such. Please heal such and such. Please get me this. Please do that. Please help this. Eventually... We're going to fall asleep with our own prayers. Our own prayers will put us to sleep. I want to share with you today a method of praying that is designed to help keep us from falling into that rut, that prayer rut, that will help invigorate our prayer, that will help equip us as prayer warriors, that will get us and break us out of the gimme, gimme rut and open up new avenues of prayer. It is a, a method that is designed to help foster what prayer was meant to be. It will foster and nurture our relationship with God. The prayer that I'm talking about today is the ACTS prayer. A-C-T-S. It's an acronym that is easy to remember because it is the fifth book of the New Testament. And it stands for Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and supplication. And each of these four areas, broad areas, are designed to nurture our relationship and to build our prayer life. And we'll take a look at each today in this term. The A for Acts is where we start. A stands for adoration. Adoration comes from a word which simply means to adore. Adoration means to adore. We adore God. Our prayer starts not with ourselves, not focusing on ourselves, not focusing on the people around us, but focusing on God. Our prayer starts with God. We adore God. What does it mean to adore something? Well, when we adore something, it, it literally means that we feel a deep affection for it. We love something or someone with a deep affection. Think of a person in your life that you adore? Perhaps your spouse? No? Maybe? <laughs> a child. Maybe a child. Or a special friend in your life. I hope, I hope that uh, you did answer yes to the spouse one, but if not, we can talk about that later. <laughs> um, a spouse, a child, a beloved friend, a parent, uh, a, a close relative, somebody that you adore, somebody that you're close to, somebody that you feel a deep affection for. Think about how you feel when you're around them. Think about what feelings you have. Think about what they do to you and what you do to them and how you um, build 
each other up, up. You like to be around them. You enjoy things about them. Things about them make you smile. You know things about them that maybe few or no other people know. So you adore them. You, you feel deep affection for them. But how do you adore God? How do you actively adore God? It's a little harder because God is sometimes abstract. He's invisible. He's sometimes intangible. We can't reach out and grab him or hold him. We tell a joke and we're not sure if he's laughing or frowning. And so it's hard sometimes for us I think, to adore God. But the way that we can adore God is simple. And that is to declare the things about God that are true. The things about God that bring us joy and the things that we appreciate about Him. Other words for adoration might be praise or worship. Adoration is a time of giving praise and worship to God. We venerate Him. We reverence Him. We show Him the respect that He deserves. We exalt God, lift Him up. We magnify Him by highlighting His divine characteristics. We focus our thoughts on His character and His nature. We celebrate God for who He is. Now, if you're not used to doing this, at first this may seem awkward, this may feel a bit strange, and it may be difficult. You may feel even a little silly telling God about Himself. Because doesn't He know about Himself already? I mean, doesn't God know how holy He is? Why does He need us to tell Him that He's holy? Doesn't He know that He's just? Why does He need us to declare His justice? And yet, I think that oftentimes adoration God uses as much to remind us about who He is. And I think that by declaring who He is, it begins to build within us those feelings of adoration. The act of adoration results in the feelings of adoration. And keep in mind, adoration is probably one of the major job descriptions that we will have when we get to heaven. We will sing God's praise and glory forever. So, Earth is kind of like a training ground for heaven, right? So if we practice on Earth, when we get to heaven, we'll be that much better. We'll have that much of a head start. But it is a heavenly activity that we are participating in. But what if you sit there and say, sounds good in theory, but how do you do that? I mean, how do you start? Where do you begin? Like, I, I like the idea, but when I sit down and I want to adore God, all I can think of is, God is good. God is great. And do we thank Him for our food? Yeah, it's, it's kind of awkward for us because we're not used to it. So one of the ways that we can kind of develop the practice of adoration is by borrowing from other people who do it better than us. Or maybe have learned in the process how to do it. One of the places, one of the great, perhaps the best place to start to learn how to adore God and to whom we turn to borrow words of adoration is the Bible itself. We turn to the Psalms and we find throughout the Psalms words of adoration. Listen, I'm going to share a few with you. Psalm 18, 3. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise. Psalm 18, 46. The Lord lives. That's very important. The Lord lives. He's not something that we imagine. Not something that we can reimagine. It's not someone that we invented. God lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be my God and my Savior. Be exalted in your strength, O Lord. We sing praise to your wondrous might. I shout my praise to you. I tell about all the wonderful things you have done. Blessed be the Lord, for he has shown me his marvelous kindness. These passages from Scripture are unadulterated praise and worship and adoration. It's an expression that we say, that we sing, that we shout, that we call out. It's a heartfelt truth that we learn to feel as we do it. But Scriptures aren't the only place. Perhaps Scriptures don't speak to your heart right now, or perhaps you're looking for another place to turn. Another great place to find words of adoration to train us in the act of adoration are hymns. 
We turn to the hymns, turn to the praises, the choruses. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Lord, we lift your name on high. Lord, we love to sing your praises. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Early in the morning, my song shall rise to you. Holy, 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 merciful, mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, O oh, you of God and man, the Son, thee will I cherish, thee will I honor, thou my soul's glory, joy, and crown. The list of hymns, nearly endless. Any hymnal can fill your day with hours of adoration. If you've got the internet, you've got days of adoration at your fingertips. Songs that declare God's holiness, His strength, His righteousness. Songs that declare who God is, that He is our rock, our Savior, our Redeemer, our Judge. All these are adoration. And they will teach our hearts to adore God. Ultimately, what we're, our goal is, is to cultivate within ourselves a heart that naturally adores God. And so these are great places to start, great places to return to, great places to use and borrow from, to cultivate that heart within us. They help us learn how to appreciate God and to express that appreciation for His beauty. Adoration should flow naturally and spontaneously from our hearts. But this won't happen unless we train ourselves to do it. Then seeing his glory, seeing God's majesty, seeing God's greatness may remind us of our own stature, of our own shortcomings, of our own failings. And so the next step, A stands for adoration, next we turn to confession. Confession is the next step in the prayer of the Acts. You see, we are made in God's image. In the Genesis, we read that God created male and female in His image, that we are the bearers of His likeness, but because of sin, His image in us is all messed up. We imperfectly bear His perfect image. It's like a picture of a landscape, right? If you go someplace and it's gorgeous, you look and you see the mountain. And you say to yourself, fabulous God, amazing. I have got to take this image home with me. And you take that picture, and you take it to your friend, and your friend picks up that picture and looks at it and says, nice. You look at that picture and say, no, it's not that. Look, it's majestic. It's fabulous. The picture doesn't fully capture the majesty of the place. We bear His image, which is perfect, but we bear it imperfectly. It's flawed in us. Where He is flawless, we have fallen short. Where He is righteous, we are immoral. And this flawed image in us is the result of sin. And so long as sin remains in us, we continue to be incomplete and perfect. So long as we refuse to give up that sin through confession. Confession is the means by which we acknowledge our sin, the imperfection that has marked our souls, and that God removes that imperfection and rebellion. 1 John 1 tells us that God washes us and makes us clean. He takes those broken pieces of our lives and makes something beautiful out of them. Brian Mangus introduced me to a movie in the youth group. Uh, I was at five years ago, Joshua. The movie Joshua, something like five years ago. And Joshua, the movie Joshua, and the main character is Joshua, is supposed to be what it would be like if Jesus, Yeshua, Joshua, came to the United States today and came to a small town in, in our area. And 